By the middle of the next century, nearly one-third of the U.S. population will be over age 65. Scientists believe that oxidative damage is behind many of the maladies that come with aging, including cardiovascular disease and cancer. At USDA's Human Nutrition Research Center, Dr. Ryan Pryor and his colleagues are looking for ways to combat the aging process. We're using a procedure to measure total antioxidant capacity of foods and biological samples, such as blood. We have demonstrated in uh, clinical trials that the antioxidant capacity of an individual's blood increases after they eat fruits or vegetables that score high in ORAC, as we call it, oxygen radical absorbance capacity. The pigments that give these foods their rich colors are responsible for the potent antioxidants. Early evidence suggests that high ORAC fruits and vegetables could play an important role in preventing the long-term effects of oxidation on brain function, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. It looks like spinach is going to turn out to be pretty good for the brain. We started fortifying diets uh, in rats about six months uh, of age with spinach and we looked at changes in the brain that normally occur. We found that these uh, animals did not display any of the changes in the brain that we normally see in animals this age. That is memory performance on some of our behavioral tasks that we looked at. And uh, I think this uh, speaks well for what we can do possibly down the road a bit in humans with regard to these extracts. If further research supports these findings, millions of aging people may be able to guard against diseases by adding high ORAC foods to their diets. In Boston, Massachusetts, Marcos Ocada is reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. A new breed of rice could mean more nutrition for people and animals and less potential for water pollution from manure. Scientists with the USDA's Agricultural Research Service in Stuttgart, Arkansas, say the new rice has less phytic acid than other varieties. The phytic acid is a form of largely indigestible phosphorus for, for um, monogastric animals, uh, ourselves, pigs, chickens, fish too. Not only is that phosphorus itself not very available, uh, in, in feed animals that phosphorus then goes on through and adds to the waste problem. The next phase of their research was to make low phytic acid rice visually distinguishable from other rice varieties now in the marketplace. They all look alike. Um, in a way that's good because that means the mutant is productive. But it also gives us, a, it gives us a challenge because we cannot, if we cannot uh, identify them in the field, there's always a chance of getting seed mixture. And particularly if it went in the farm fields, uh, the, the problem would be magnified. So researchers put marker genes in the new rice that gave it a golden color. Now we have a low phytic acid a mutant that we can see. Uh, I always like to say you can see it in the field, you can see it in the farm truck, you can see it in the elevator. This new rice would be of significant nutritional value to developing nations where mineral deficiency is common. I'm Bob Ellison reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Tomatoes with much more lycopene than those now found in stores may be on the horizon. Lycopene is a large molecule that is responsible for the red color in tomatoes. Biologist Betty K. Ishida with the USDA's Agricultural Research Service is uncovering the genetic pathway for tomato ripening and specifically the production of the compound lycopene. They're grown in tissue culture in the cool temperature which is about 62 degrees if these tomatoes are grown at regular temperature, they don't produce as much lycopene. So we're looking for the genes that are being activated at this cool temperature. The goal of our research is to provide a better tomato, a more nutritious tomato for the public, one that's higher in lycopene content. Medical researchers have also shown that lycopene in processed tomato products, like spaghetti sauce, rather than fresh tomatoes, may provide more cancer prevention benefits. Epidemiological studies have shown that lycopene has been correlated with a reduction in risk of prostate cancer and also lung and gastrointestinal cancers. And this is why there's a great deal of interest right now. Ishida found that her experimental tomatoes have 10 times more lycopene than field-grown tomatoes. Her aim is to isolate the genes responsible for increased lycopene production so they can be incorporated into commercial varieties. The advantages would be better ripening control, 
deeper red color, and potentially greater health benefits from tomatoes. In Albany, California, Marcos Ocali is reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Southern soybean growers now have the option of planting a non-transgenically modified soybean called soyola. This new soybean variety was developed by Agricultural Research Service scientist Joseph Burton at North Carolina State University. Soyola yields an oil that does not need to be hydrogenated in order to improve its usefulness for cooking and to extend its shelf life. Soyola is a, is a soybean variety that was developed using standard uh, traditional plant breeding methods. There are no transgenes involved in the development of this variety and in that sense it's a non-GMO type variety and uh, would be attractive to buyers who prefer to buy non-GMO type varieties. Because Soyola oil does not have to go through the hydrogenation process, it does not produce the bulk of dietary trans fats now recognized as unhealthy for the heart. Soyola has a uh, oil quality that has reduced linolenic acid and that makes the oil more stable. That is, once the oil is processed, uh, consumers can use it in cooking and the bad flavors and odors that come with cooking oil won't be as evident with this particular oil as they would be with the soybean oil that did not have low linolenic acid. Soyola would be ideal for the cooking and salad oil markets and is best suited for growing in southern states. Such as uh, North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, the Boot Hill of Missouri, Arkansas, northern Mississippi, northern Alabama, and South Carolina, and northern Georgia. There will be some production this year. More production will be in 2001. Marco Socadi is reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The USDA's Agricultural Research Service is studying the possible health benefits of the trace mineral selenium. ARS researchers say selenium could help prevent chronic long-term diseases like cancer and heart disease, and that studies have been encouraging. If the initial results that were so promising that cancer rates can be decreased by up to half by adding selenium to the diet were to turn out to be reproducible, then lives extended could be hundreds of thousands of people living a longer life by preventing or delaying the onset of these chronic diseases. Researchers also believe that selenium has a general property in protecting against viruses, including the human immunodeficiency virus that causes AIDS. There was a study in Florida that showed that intravenous drug users who had HIV when they checked their blood selenium, those who had the higher blood selenium levels were 20 times more likely to survive for five years than those that had low blood selenium levels. Selenium is not a miracle food, but Hawk says it's one more thing that could improve people's lives. Nobody's going to live forever and nobody's going to stay young forever, but every year we can stave off the development of these kinds of diseases of old age, the better off we all are. So it, it works out in years of productive life added. Meats and whole grain foods are common sources of selenium, along with over-the-counter vitamin supplements. I'm Bob Ellison reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. USDA Agricultural Research Service scientists believe zinc may affect every general function of the human body. ARS scientists say zinc is important to humans because it helps turn our genes on and off at the right time and also helps our immune, nervous, and digestive systems. We are doing uh, research to understand zinc homeostasis in whole body, especially at the cellular level, and we are conducting research in zinc transporter level and we will want to understand how many zinc transporters in our human body and what they do. ARS researchers say zinc is especially important to infants, toddlers and preschool children. Marginal zinc deficiency will affect children's learning ability and children's behavior and also affect the children's food intake. They will have a lower appetite. 
Marginal zinc deficiency can also occur in teens and adults, and symptoms include growth retardation, hair loss, diarrhea, delayed sexual maturation and impotence, eye and skin lesions, and loss of appetite. Researchers want to come up with tests to detect zinc deficiency early. Then we can give them the supplements to improve the health status and then eliminate the, any uh, potential uh, disease caused by marginal zinc deficiency. Good sources of zinc include red meat, poultry, fortified breakfast cereal, some seafood, whole grains, dry beans and nuts. I'm Bob Ellison reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Americans love chocolate. Unfortunately, so do three pathogenic fungi. Cacao trees produce pods containing beans used for making chocolate. All three fungi have caused severe yield losses to the three million ton cacao bean crop. They have inflicted economic hardship on five to six million small farmers in South America, Africa, and Asia who produce and depend on the annual cash crop. Scientists with the U.S. Department of Agriculture are working on the problem. Their scientific names are Phytophthora, uh, Crinopellus, and Maniliophthora, biocontrol agents which are naturally occurring microorganisms that can be used to control plant diseases will hopefully alleviate these disease problems and make it economical for the crop to be grown more widely. Scientists with the Agricultural Research Service are part of a cooperative research project that includes national and international research institutes. Their goal is to identify biological control strategies to fight these diseases. We have a good indication that if we get the right amount of the biocontrol agent on the right site, either the pod surface or the flower, we can reduce the amount of disease. Very little work has been done on biological control. I think this could be a very good integrated pest management strategy. The scientists say that biocontrol is not a silver bullet that will suppress all three major fungal diseases. However, applying biocontrol sprays along with pruning, proper plant nutrition and the use of cultivars tolerant to these diseases should improve yields by lessening the incidence of the disease. In Beltsville, Maryland, Marco Socadis reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Researchers at USDA's Agricultural Research Services facilities in Beltsville, Maryland are studying the best ways for farmers and ranchers to keep animal manure runoff from getting to bodies of water. Our goal is to prevent organisms um, originating from animal manures that may be applied to the field from them being transported to surface water. Our goal is to ensure that agriculture is not contaminating our lakes and our rivers and our streams. ARS researchers say that compared to bare soil, producer-installed grass buffer strips are very effective at keeping bacteria from animal manure out of waterways. If they're going to apply manure to their fields, if they have a stream or a creek or a river uh, that's near their field, the goal is to say, here's how wide of a grass buffer strip you need between your fields where you're applying the manure uh, and the surface water. Researchers at this 7,000-acre site near the nation's capital compare different sized buffer strips on land with varying slopes to find out how far and fast bacteria can move through grass. They also test manure from different animals. In addition to stopping bacteria, they say their research can also help producers determine where bacteria is coming from. But if they do have a grass buffer strip of a certain width, that our data suggests that they would not be contaminating the water. And in fact, if it's found that the water is contaminated, um, it would not likely be from them. It would not be from, from their fields and from their manure. ARS researchers say grass buffer strips can reduce by close to 99% the amount of bacteria that gets to waterways from animal manure runoff. I'm Bob Ellison reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You have four legs, four stomachs, and you are ready for a snack. What's to eat? If you are a lucky cow, you have your choice of nutritious native plants like wild rye or temp Utah sweet veg, thanks to the work of scientists with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. At the Agricultural Research Service Forage and Range Research Unit in Logan, Utah, 
Scientists are using these native plants to thwart invasive weeds and to revegetate lands denuded by wildfire. Basin wild rye is a tall bunch grass that provides forage for livestock and wildlife and shelter for their calves. It helps prevent soil erosion and improves the quality of the watershed. It also contributes to the biodiversity of the land. Another forage is the Temp Utah Sweet Vetch, which thrives in areas with 12 to 18 inches of annual precipitation and yields a plentiful supply of attractive purple flowers which later produce long flattened seed pods. Researchers selected temp from other promising sweet vetch plants because of its vigor, adaptability, and high seed production. No wonder it's in high demand by land managers and conservationists for use in reclaiming our native rangelands. Commercial seed companies now know more about how to raise these native grasses for seed production so they can be more widely used for the reclamation and restoration of the West. In Logan, Utah, Marcos Ocadiz reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The first genetically engineered dwarf pear tree of an existing variety has been developed by scientists with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Agricultural Research Service horticulturalists Ralph Scorza and Richard Bell at the Appalachian Fruit Research Station in Kearneysville, West Virginia, have developed dwarf bosk pear trees by inserting a gene originally isolated from a bacterium. What we've done is inserted a gene which produces a reduction in the growth of the variety known as bosk. Dwarf pear trees would have the advantage of being easier to manage, uh, easier to prune, harvest, and spray, and have the added advantage that on a per acre basis, because you can get more trees in the same land area, they would be more productive. The scientists say the pear industry relies on only a few major varieties and needs to improve them. Dwarfing may help them accomplish this. For those growers not interested in dwarf trees, the scientists have developed a peach tree with a new columnar shape. Over the past 12 years, we've developed a radically new growth habit on peach trees, one that produces columnar trees, the very upright form, uh, which we think has uh, quite a bit of potential for high density production systems and the home grower. And we have now tests going out in 10 states where interested researchers and nurserymen are looking at these trees and how they will produce in the various parts of the U.S. Like dwarfs, the columnar trees eliminate the large space necessary between traditional trees. So chemicals and fertilizers can be applied to smaller areas, saving the grower money and reducing environmental impacts. Marco Socali is reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Salt cedar was brought into the U.S. from the Far East in the early 1800s. It was used to protect stream banks from erosion, but no one realized that without natural enemies, salt cedar would crowd out willows, cottonwoods, and other plants crucial to wildlife. In many areas, this plant makes a very dense thicket, makes it impenetrable to uh, most wildlife. It uses extensive amounts of water, which is important for agricultural purposes, and also for wildlife as well. Salt cedar also increases soil salinity and wildfire frequency. In 1991, scientists with the USDA's Agricultural Research Service discovered a natural enemy from China. We've been working with a leaf beetle that actually feeds on the little detailed uh, foliage here, strips that off completely. Uh, through a number of seasons, continued defoliation of this plant may actually be able to help control the vast amounts that you see here uh, in the area around where we're standing right now. Researchers have found no plants other than salt cedar on which the beetles feed and reproduce. One of the most important things that we do is do a lot of safety testing. We work with these insects first overseas where we evaluate their natural host range, what they feed on to make sure that they don't feed on crops that are important to our agriculture or native species that we're concerned about. Once the salt cedar has been greatly reduced, it is expected that the beetle populations will naturally decline since the beetles have no other source of food. In Albany, California, Marco Socadi is reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Each winter, the American white pelican returns to the lower Mississippi River Delta to feed on fish. The pelican carries a small parasitic flatworm. 
that can kill catfish and hurt the Delta catfish industry. Scientists with the USDA's Agricultural Research Service in Stuttgart, Arkansas, are studying the problem. It's mature in the bird, produces eggs. The eggs are shed in the water from the bird. They hatch and uh, form a little organism that penetrates in the snail. They undergo multiple divisions in the snail and uh, erupt as up to 100,000 units over a period of several months and penetrate the fish. And then they uh, develop about five months to a semi-mature position in the fish where then the bird eats it and uh, in a very short period of about five days it develops in the gut of the bird to an adult and produces eggs and transfers on. The scientists have developed a chemical combination of copper sulfate and citric acid to target the freshwater snail. The treatment has proven very effective at reducing the threat of the parasite to farm-raised catfish. In order to stop this we have no treatment for the uh, actual parasite so we have to eliminate or restrict one of the hosts uh, the birds are federally protected and that leaves us the snail of course we have to keep the fish because that's our product so we are developing methods to kill the snails this treatment was approved for use on snails by the environmental protection agency and is widely used in arkansas and mississippi for this purpose as a result, the state of Arkansas has not had a serious snail infestation since 1999. I'm Bob Ellison reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. For more than a decade, ARS researchers' goal has been to provide livestock producers the opportunity to predetermine the sex of offspring. Thanks to the Beltsville sperm sorting technology developed by animal physiologist Lawrence Johnson, it is now possible. The sperm sexing process that we've developed here and now have improved is based on the fact that X sperm carry about 4% more DNA than Y sperm. We treat them with a fluorescent dye, pass them in front of a laser beam on the cell sorting system, and in that process able to separate into two different tubes and then use them for insemination. Dr. Johnson is head of the Germplasm and Gamete Physiology Laboratory, part of USDA's Beltsville, Maryland Agricultural Research Center. Johnson and colleagues have successfully proved this method works for most mammals, including cattle, swine, and sheep. Now, it's about 90% effective. Uh, that is, uh, if you were producing all females, for example, dairy farmers would be interested in producing mostly females, he'd get nine out of 10 females from using X sorted sperm. Now, uh, a beef producer is interested in more males because they grow faster and more feed efficient. And so you would be using Y sperm in that particular situation. These improvements make the technology more efficient for use by livestock agriculture. Johnson is collaborating with scientists around the world to establish and perfect the technology for commercial development. In Beltsville, Maryland, Marco Socadis reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Turkey hens lay only 70 to 100 eggs a year. So it is crucial those precious fertilized eggs hatch and grow into turkeys, the star of Thanksgiving dinner. In 1997, there were about 430 million eggs that actually were laid in the United States. But about 100 million failed to hatch. And this is a major concern to the turkey industry, major loss of income for them. Dr. Murray Bax is one of the three scientists here at USDA's Beltsville, Maryland Agriculture Research Center conducting research in turkey reproduction. His research focuses primarily on early embryo survival. With all those eggs being laid, the hatcheries don't have enough room to incubate the eggs. So what they do is they place them in a cold room. These eggs are stored in the cold room for five to 25 days. When the incubators become available, the eggs are transferred to the incubators. But egg storage has a significant drawback. As you increase egg storage, there is a higher frequency of early embryonic mortality. After only five days of cold egg storage, nearly 50% of the embryonic cells die. Now this is a major factor contributing to early embryonic death. If the industry was able to incubate the eggs after only three days of cold storage, hatchability would be considerably higher. Last year, consumers gobbled up nearly 4.7 billion pounds of turkey. 
That's about 18 pounds per person, up from 2.9 pounds per person in the 1940s, when USDA researchers developed the historic Beltsville small white turkey. ARS scientists have been conducting turkey research in Beltsville since 1934, which is recognized here in the U.S. and throughout the world. Marco Socadis, Beltsville, Maryland, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The animal industry has routinely stored livestock embryos in very cold temperatures for long-term preservation. This technology has been available for the cattle industry since the mid-1980s, but until recently has been unsuccessful with pigs. There are physiological and cellular differences that pig embryos undergo which uh, render them susceptible to cryopreservation. And so what we've done, we've utilized vitrification technology and stabilizing the embryos prior to cryopreservation. And the vitrification allows the rapid cooling of the embryos in about three seconds in liquid nitrogen. And this technology is important to bypass any harmful problems that occur during preservation. And it allows the development of live offspring after transfer into recipient females. Dr. John Dobrinsky is an animal physiologist here at USDA's Beltsville, Maryland Agriculture Research Center. His cutting-edge research could potentially create new global opportunities to expand the $11 billion a year swine industry. This technology will allow swine breeding and genetic companies, as well as producers, to import and export valuable genetic resources in the form of germplasm, such as embryos instead of live animals. In this way, we can draw from these global genetic pools of specific production traits that we're interested in or disease resistance traits in future production of our lines. In this way, we can get around the logistical and health problems associated with shipping live animals. What does this breakthrough mean for consumers? It will enable the production and conservation of viable genetic resources for our producers so that we can ensure a safe, wholesome, and healthy pork product for the consumers. In Beltsville, Maryland, Marcos Ocades reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And that utilizes DNA The markers. newest version of a chicken genome so map gives USDA researcher Hans Cheng hope for developing a chicken-resistant tumeric disease, a viral disease that causes tumors in the birds. What's made all this possible is what we call the, the evolution of genomics. And genomics is whole animal genetics, which has enabled us to make great strides. We've been able to develop what are called genetic and physical maps of any organism. Although the focus is on Merrick's disease first and then other diseases, Cheng and his colleagues with the Agricultural Research Service are searching for the best combination of genes and proteins that will promote resistance to many diseases and improve poultry production. What uh, we want to be able to do is build the tools that enable us to obtain the information where all the important genes are. And that important tool is the genetic map. And so a genetic map is essentially just like a, a highway map if I have a map, well, I know exactly where to go. Same thing with a genetic map. What I have is I have a whole bunch of DNA markers, and then I'm looking for those markers that point me to the right direction to say where the important gene is for, in this case, Merrick's disease resistance. Before the first vaccine was developed in the 1960s by USDA scientists, the disease caused losses of $300 million a year. Even with the vaccine, losses can still run as high as $100 million a year. Cheng is counting on the genome map to help reduce these losses. In East Lansing, Michigan, Marcos Socadis reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Soy Screen is the name for a new all-natural skin and hair care product developed by scientists with the USDA's Agricultural Research Service in Peoria, Illinois. The Midwest may be miles from ocean shorelines where the product will get a lot of use, but it is in the heart of U.S. soybean production. Well, soy screen is a, uh, a product that we've developed based on our biocatalysis research where we want to modify lipids, mainly uh, commodity crop oils such as soybean or corn, and modify them into uh, more value-added or useful items. And our first example of this was soy screen which is a soy-based sunscreen. 
The U.S. soybean industry generates an estimated 800 million pounds of surplus oil each year. With SoyScreen, scientists hope to cast soybean oil into the lucrative skin and hair care market. You have chemical sunscreen ingredients currently used, and they're used in sunscreen formulations, cosmetics, skin and hair care products, and this would be an all-natural substitute that you could replace those chemical active ingredients with. Soy screen is also being studied for other agricultural and commercial uses. Soy screen is also being looked at as a coating for seeds to protect the seeds from UV exposure upon initial planting. It's also being looked at as a possible ingredient in polyurethanes where the finished plastic or the finished product would have the UV absorbing material directly in the polymer itself instead of as an additive. Environmentally conscious consumers might also take comfort from knowing that soy screen is biodegradable and non-toxic. The process for making it uses recyclable enzymes rather than harsh solvents. In Washington, Bob Ellison reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Did you think vegetable oil was just for cooking? Well, guess again. USDA Agricultural Research Service scientists in Peoria, Illinois, have devised a way to convert fatty acids in vegetable oil into entirely new chemical compounds with antimicrobial, industrial, or biomedical properties. They do it with a process called bioconversion, which uses microorganisms and enzymes to change a molecule's structure. In our case, is to change the fatty acids component of soybean oil to make it more functional for other activities that would increase the value of soybean oil. One such compound, called DOD, curbed the laboratory growth of a type of yeast that sometimes causes thrush and other infections in humans. Another compound, called TOD, stopped the rice blast fungus, raising the prospect for a biological fungicide against this crop pest. Both compounds are now patented and available for licensing and are recent examples of scientists' efforts to open new, value-added markets for vegetable oils, particularly from soybeans. They are inexpensive common fatty acids of soybean oil that have industrial and medical applications. So the key is uh, to be able to develop uh, effective bioprocess that can produce large quantity to achieve this goal uh, for applied industrial uses. This bioconversion research has also given rise to three other new compounds, including THFA, a compound derived from linolenic acid in soybean oil, which could have cancer-fighting properties. In Washington, Bob Ellison reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Fire ants a tiny pest with a ferocious sting are spreading. Until recently, red imported fire ants occupied about 300 million acres in 12 southern states and Puerto Rico. Now they have become established in California and New Mexico. USDA scientists in Gainesville, Florida have found ways to keep fire ants in check. The disease, Thelahania solenopsis, is a microsporidian, a small protozoan that infects fire ant colonies. It was discovered in Brazil in fire ant colonies there. It slowly debilitates the colony by reducing the weight of the colony queen. As she becomes smaller and smaller, she lays fewer and fewer eggs, and eventually the colony dies out. We have not found it in any other ants, and we have not found it in anything else. It does not affect plants, and it does not affect animals. Just fire ants, the imported fire ants. Fire ants are thought to have spread to the United States from South America on ships in the early 1930s. Since then, their spread has been slow but steady. And the reason that they're spreading is that when they left their homeland in South America, they left all of their natural control agents back there. They simply overwhelmed our native ant species. And the native ant species still have all of these diseases and these predators and parasites acting on them. The fire ants don't. What we hope to do with our research is to bring up these pathogens, predators, and parasites to reduce the fire ant population in the United States so that it is at much, much lower levels and the native ants can compete with it on an even playing field. Since the first release of Thelohania in Florida in 1998, it has spread to more than 75% of the colonies the scientists are monitoring. 
The scientists hope to see a major impact on fire ant populations as their pathogen program continues. In Gainesville, Florida, Marcos Ocadiz reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Scientists with USDA's Agricultural Research Service in Gainesville, Florida have found new ways to keep fire ant populations in check. It's part of a new environmentally friendly strategy to use natural enemies to control the ants. Fire ants now infest millions of acres in the southern United States every year. The scientists are releasing Brazilian flies that attack fire ants. The biggest impact these flies will have on the ants is that they will cause the, the fire ants to run and hide and while they're running and hiding the native ants will be able to forage and eat the food that the fire ant would have otherwise been able to eat. Scientist Sanford Porter is hoping the flies and other natural enemies will eventually tip the ecological balance against the fire ants in the United States so they can drop from being the dominant species. These flies hover about two or three millimeters above the ants and they dive in and inject an egg into the thorax of the ant. And that egg within a few days hatches and the little maggot burrows his way up into the ant's head. The head falls off, the maggot uses the ant's head as a little pupil case. Fire ant populations are greater here than in South America, their native country, where natural enemies appear to keep them in check. Since Porter's initial release in 1997 in Florida, the flies have survived. They've gone through many generations and appear to be permanently established players in the fight against fire ants. In Gainesville, Florida, Marcos Ocali is reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. When it comes to eating tree leaves, gypsy moth caterpillars respect no boundaries. They'll readily infest natural forests, parks, and backyards. Burlap tree skirts offer some protection, but Agricultural Research Service entomologist Jeffrey White sees room for improvement. By putting burlap around the trunk of a tree, you'll provide them a hiding spot, and the homeowner or land manager will be able to come along and remove these caterpillars. Now, this can be quite time consuming if you have more than a few trees. At USDA's Insect Biocontrol Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland, White is testing a latex coating that delivers a chemical punch to the pests. It's a commercial product. It's a latex-based insecticide, and this is applied underneath the burlap skirt. Now, when the gypsy moth will come and hide under the skirt, it receives a small but fatal dose of this insecticide. In experiments we did last year, in a short exposure, six to eight hours, we had over a 60% reduction in the numbers. By comparison, almost 100% survived beneath the untreated skirts. Scientists are also testing a beneficial fungi that kill the caterpillars once they've ingested them, a fitting in for a pest that in most years wreaks havoc on millions of acres of woodland. In Beltsville, Maryland, Marco Socadi is reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. A new environmentally friendly insecticide is being developed by scientists with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Known as spinosad, the spray might offer an alternative to malathion, the most effective chemical for fighting tropical fruit flies, such as the Mediterranean fruit fly. When medflies invade states like California or Florida, it can attack hundreds of different kinds of crops and can easily cost millions to eradicate. And the nice thing about spinosad is that it kills insects in a bait spray, for example, these fruit flies we've been working on in very low doses. We used a bait to attract the flies and then place the insecticide in the bait so that they had to eat it to be affected by the pesticide and hopefully die. Scientist Stephen Peck with the Agricultural Research Service selected coffee fields for his test site because, among other reasons, medflies love coffee berries. Coffee turns out to be a preferred host for the medfly because uh, it also comes from Africa, and so they, they, they may have a long history together. This is a great place to research the effect of pesticides because they don't spray coffee. They uh, let it go because it does not affect the bean. ARS researchers in Hawaii and Texas are continuing to explore the potential of this chemical, primarily because it is safe to most beneficial insects. Spinosad is already registered for use on apples, almonds, citrus, eggplant, tomatoes, and cotton. In Hawaii, Marcos Tocali is reporting 
for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Researchers with the U.S. Department of Agriculture are using a new kind of sterile medfly in their efforts to reduce populations of this major pest of fruit trees and other crops. The TSL medfly gets its name from the genetic susceptibility of the strain's female to high temperatures. TSL is short for temperature sensitive lethal. This gene has been incorporated into a medfly strain such that it now can be used to separate males and females. Female eggs can be exposed to a temperature of 34 degrees Celsius for a period of about 12 hours and female medflies can be killed in the egg stage. These females are not tolerant to that temperature whereas males are. Field studies show that in the absence of sterile females, the sterile males disperse better and are more competitive compared with wild male medflies. The females are killed, or virtually all of them, uh, with that temperature exposure. The males survive and then can be reared on the larval diet so that you produce an all-male strain. Now, work has shown in the last 10 years that releasing all males, or close to 100% males, is several times more effective at controlling the wildflies in the field than is releasing 50% males and 50% females, which is the normal sex ratio that you see in a regular strain. Eliminating the females also will save an estimated 30 to 40% in rearing costs. USDA's Agricultural Research Service will continue to assess the TSL strain through large-scale field releases and other quality control tests. In Honolulu, Hawaii, Marcos Ocales reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture.